I think what I am going to speak today has been more or less covered and discussed till now, but the focus and repetition is very important in learning. So this is the point that I want to highlight, like we'll be repeating more or less the same informations to the postgraduates and now in the case format, but it is very relevant because then, then only we can understand the importance in the case. We have Dr. Kapoor has already covered beautifully the history, examination, importance of X-ray. Dr. Vivek has covered biopsies and our panelists have beauty, beautifully spoken about the relative importance of each and every step. And now in the case, I will be discussing these steps again so that we understand how these steps actually help us in narrowing our differential and in diagnosing or, or in planning our treatment. So we'll start with this case. She is a 24 years old female. She presented with an incision biopsy outside with now a large swelling in the lower end of her thigh. And you can see there is an impending uh, skin breakdown on the just above the previous incision scar. And there's a large tumor around the lower end of her thigh or lower end of her femur. So, so, uh, as Dr. Kapoor has mentioned, like this is a painful bone neoplasm in a less than 40 years of age, and we are thinking more of a primary bone neoplasms. So, uh, we go back to the history in this case, like what is the site, what is uh, how is the pain, what is the number of lesions, any history of trauma, what is the progression, and how what is the family history. So, most important thing here is like, does these points actually help us in diagnosis? Will always keep on enumerating the points but what is important here is whether these points are helping us in diagnosis or not going to these points one by one so that we can narrow our differential in a case is the most important is the site or the location so we need to see whether it is a joint is involved or not whether it's a single site or multiple site and whether or not the lesion is an axial skeleton because as dr kapoor is mentioning there are some tumor which have a predilection for axial skeleton huh? Going to the history of trauma, like almost all malignant tumors that we see will give some history of trauma. So any relevance of history of trauma, I think sometimes it will help us in clinching the diagnosis. And this is how it helps is this 22 year old male patient presents with pain in paraspinal region for four months following a trauma. He was working on a chair and it, he fell down and the MRI was reported as mesenchymal neoplasm arising from 12th rib. So when, we, when I asked in detail about the trauma, it was a significant trauma. He fell from a chair. There was, since then, he's having a pain and there was no constitutional symptom. So I, I asked for a CT scan then, and you can see that a lesion, which is a well ossified lesion next to the rib, which shows a peripheral ossification with central lucency. And based on this ra classical radiological pictures, the diagnosis was myositis ossificans. So a history of trauma is very relevant in a suspected malignant neoplasm, not for a diagnosis purpose, but for to rule out other important differentials, most important, which is myositis ossificans. Going to the duration of the symptoms, we all know the rule that the rapid growing short duration, the more chances it to be of an aggressive lesion. Our patient had a duration of eight months. And now uh, just for to understand another example, this 71 year old male presented to me in OPD with pain and swelling we did an x-ray and it was showing a lesion in the medial femoral condyle lower end. But the patient by chance had another x-ray which was done 15 years back, which also showed a similar kind of a lesion, although the x-rays were not very clear here. So we know that because of a long duration, we knew we know that they, this is a lesion which is there for very long and we could simply main, uh, make a diagnosis of a bone infarct. Other important history point is a pain which is whether it is a persistent pain or whether it is night pain. And we know, as Dr. Kapoor is mentioning, in our uh, various scenarios, different kind of a pain, like an osteoderstoma having a classical night pain. And other important thing that the pain tells us in history is, it definitely tells us that the lesion is symptomatic and we need to do something about it. We cannot ignore a painful bone neoplasm. We have to do something about a painful bone neoplasm. Going to the family history in a bone tumor, I think it is important because we need to rule out major syndromic associations of bone tumors, which is a retinoblastoma syndrome, 
or an hereditary multiple exostosis. These are the two symptoms. In retinoblastoma, we have a much more uh, higher, which are higher incidence of an, of, an, of an osteosarcoma. In NHME, we see a multiple exostosis or a chondrosarcoma. Going to our case, we had a pain in the swell and the swelling for eight months. There is no history of trauma. The swelling was increasing gradually. There were no constitutional symptoms and no family history. So the next logical step is a clinical examination, which also Dr. Kapoor covered beautifully. We need to check for a general physical examination. In bone tumors, we should always examine for chest to look for any suspected metastasis where we can see some crafts or effusion. And for a generalized lymphadenopathy, as Dr. Kundu was mentioning, we can have a higher incidence of tuberculosis in our uh, subcontinent. So our lymphadenopathy is a significant finding. So our case, clinical examination, I think the most important examination here is a local examination, which is an inspection of a swelling. Uh, we all know the basic important points in inspection and palpation. In inspection, the shape of a swelling, the size of the swelling, its surface, the skin, the margins, the colors, the number and the pulsations are most important in a bone tumor case. While in palpation, the temperature, tenderness, the size of the swelling in all dimensions, the margins again, surface of the swelling, whether it is bosselated or smooth, consistency, as Dr. Kapoor was saying, a hard swelling is not definitely, it's never like a malignant bone tumor. Usually a hard swelling is a benign bone tumor, like an osteochondroma case he has shown. But a bone, malignant bone tumors are usually firm. So we have to actually check for a consistency in all the areas to understand what kind of swelling it is. We should see the fixity to the skin because this will help in planning our surgical resection, the taking our margins that I'll be covering in the end of this talk. As you can see here, there's a skin ulceration, there's a bad biopsy scar. So all this needs to go when we are resecting the tumor uh, in the final resection specimen. We need to check for the fixity of un to underlying structures, which is like fixity to the muscles where we, when we contract the muscle, the mobility of a swelling reduces in the longitudinal plane, but it maintains in a transverse plane or fixity to bone where that swelling is fixed and it cannot be moved uh, in any of the directions. For cystic swellings, we should check for fluctuation, for translucencies, but this is not relevant for, for, uh, for a, a solid swellings. We should always check for a pulsation in the swelling because many of the time a uh, metastatic swelling of an RCC or thyroid could can we can see a pulsation or a swelling arising directly from a major artery will show you a pulsation. And uh, similarly, we should check for a compressibility, which is mainly relevant for a uh, arteriovenous malformations. After we finish the local examination of the swelling, we should go ahead and check the movements around the joint, which will tell us about the intraarticular involvement and any deformity which this swelling is causing because of in infiltration of the muscles. We should check for the regional lymph nodes, although it is very uncommon for bone tumors to go to lymph node, but sometimes rarely it can go. But more important in this scenario will be like a, having an infection of a, like a tuberculosis where our regional lymphadenopathy will be much more common. We should always check for distal neurovascular status because sometimes the tumor involves the major motor nerves or the vessels and initially only the vein is compressed in many of the cases which leads to a distal swelling but the pulsations will be normal so we always have to document whether there is a swelling in the this limb which is much more than the other which can suggest only a venous compression and we always should check a major motor nerve no involvement distally and we should always see any other similar swellings at any other site because that can lead to a multiple uh, bony tumor case and the differentials will be different. So with history and examination, we should be able to at least give this diagnosis, whether it is an aggressive neoplasm involving the lower end of a femur, because as Dr. Kapoor and Dr. Brajesh Nandan, I guess was asking like most of the time the examiner is interested in, okay, what is your diagnosis? In diagnosis, we should not jump to a giant cell tumor or to an osteosarcoma. What by the end of a history and examination we should reach is to, okay, this looks to me like an, is an aggressive neoplasm in the lower end of a femur in a 24-year-old female. Uh, 
and then we should proceed with the relevant investigations to support or refute my diagnosis so after his second examination i am able to reach okay this is a tumor which has grown very fast it has involved the soft tissues it has caused some skin breakdown and in examination it was a big tumor around the lower end of a femur with uh, uh, some deformity in the knee and i am quite sure that it's an aggressive neoplasm in the lower end of a femur so then we proceed to the next logical step which are the imaging studies so this was the x ray of the same patient if dr. you Manish, want can me I to describe it come in for a moment yes dr akshay yes 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 if we can just go to the previous slide yeah this one so for the benefit of our students uh, there are uh, four things that we know here it's an aggressive neoplasm yeah and it uh, is it affects the distal end of the femur yeah. so can we just enumerate uh, what all uh, we have in history and examination to justify each of these points one is aggressive the other is neoplasm and the third is distal femur okay yeah so like i was mentioning that why the history is important is because of the it helps us in narrowing the differential so why i called it aggressive is because first thing is there is a swelling which of which is of a spontaneous onset without trauma and it has progressed to this size which is almost like 15 by 15 cm size in a duration of 8 months so a short history no trauma and rapid increase in size with pain usually suggests that the lesion is aggressive as compared to the other scenario where the lesion we say is an incidental or benign in which the history is usually very long or the lesion is detect detected on an incidental examination of a radiograph or or of a general physical examination going to why we call, want to call it as a neoplasm is based on only on the history when we know that there is a rapid increase rapid swelling a, a new onset swelling with pain we always have to keep our diagnosis of an infection in our mind as dr kundu was saying but why i want to call it as a neoplasm right now is this can only be confirmed only after examination because once i have examined the patient in the inspection i know that there is a swelling which is a, a large swelling with a, a lobulated surface firm and painful when i ex- I do a palpation i know that there is a slight raise of temperature but the swelling is bony it is fixed or it is sur- arising from the underlying bone and it is causing a lit- little mo- uh, restriction of a joint movement i know that i am dealing with much more of a bone neoplasm rather than uh, any other differential and lower end of femur is i think because of a site we can easily make out so when we are choosing our words we have to choose it very carefully like whether we want to call it aggressive or not whether we call it neoplasm or not uh, hey, here here that proof yes. here if the student here if the student make a differential diagnosis of subacute or chronic infection in lower end of femur he is not wrong he is not wrong so yes. if if they are if they have if they do not have a such a clear cut case and there is a some differential then they can keep keep a uh, diag- they can change the diagnosis to an aggressive bone lesion in the lower end of a femur because it, because many times examiner will ask is it your only one diagnosis or you have kept any differential diagnosis because that is common question from ms d or th dnb student absolutely so that is why aggressive neoplasm lower end of femur is one another point is is there any differential then the student become blank and he is tight he is frightened so therefore if he make it differential diagnosis of aggressive neoplasm along with infective pathology and if he is able to justify that also in two, two or three point or if he is, is able to just to rule out that is that is why sir the regional examination that his points in history that is why i have highlighted what are the important relevant points in history and examination that the student has to uh, note down and that will help in differentiating from one differential to other 
but yeah. in aggressive neoplasm also we are not committing it to be a benign or malignant that is yeah. the first thing a giant yes. cell tumor is also an aggressive neoplasm in the lower end of a fever yes second thing we should always have a differential of an infection in our mind in yeah. uh, whether it is a chronic uh, biogenic osteomyelitis or a tubercular yeah. osteomyelitis so that always goes in a differential because till the till now we have only done an examination and it can be an infection yes i totally agree dr akshay anything else Great. so i think i think uh, the message goes out the message goes the message goes out that uh, it will depend on the case and the examiner may or may not want to have a differential which always uh, should be there at the back of our minds absolutely yeah. i think uh, please carry on with your presentation dr manish okay. so the next logical step uh, what the examiner ask is how will you investigate how, or how will you confirm your diagnosis and and for that we need to do an x ray of an affected area and dr uh, sudhir has already covered the radiological aspect how to read a bone tumor x ray just to revise that because the repetition is very relevant uh, for us to remember is this is a x ray i'll just read this x ray for our students so that they understand how to read an x ray so we read the x rays in these four points i'll go to these points uh, one by one first thing is where is the lesion second is what is the lesion doing to the bone third is what is the bone response and fourth is anything suggestive of histology which is the matrix so going back to our x ray so this is an x ray of a mature skeleton for so this is the first line that you should, we should always say showing a lytic lesion in the metaphyseal area going up to the epiphyseal and the subchondral region so this covers my first point which is where is the lesion second is what is the lesion doing to the bone here we need to tell the zone of transition zone of transition is the area between the normal and the tumor bone and we know there is a narrow zone of transition here because we can see we can differentiate between the tumor and normal bone very clearly third is what is the bone response or uh, in this we see what the periosteal reaction there is no obvious periosteal reaction here there is some ballooning of the cortex but there is no obvious periosteal reaction and fourth thing is anything suggestive of matrix this is a no matrix lesion so there is a pathological fracture which also is covered in the second part which is what is the lesion doing to the bone so a lesion lytic destructive lesion in the metaphyseal epiphyseal region with narrow zone of transition with pathological fracture with no obvious periosteal reaction with no matrix with this kind of a uh, radiological picture i think in our mind in a 24 year old female will think of a giant cell tumor first because then once you commit in radiology what you are seeing then you have to tell the differentials so dr manish yeah uh, just in this x ray the students should know the three things they should look for the bone the lesion they should look for the joint and third is they should look for the soft tissue also absolutely because in this case there is a huge soft tissue swelling in the anterior part and medial uh, lateral part so yeah. always comment on the bone joint and soft tissue these are three things in the body and then they can come to the location type of lesion destruction what is the lesion doing to the bone and what is bone responding to the lesion and what is the type of matrix so bone soft tissue and joint look for all the three and then you will be no, will you will not be able to forget the even the soft tissue swelling as here there is in suprapatellar area there is huge soft tissue swelling along with uh, lateral side absolutely sir yeah so uh, i'll not cover the radiology because i think this is already been covered with doc, by dr kapoor so i'll just skip this part uh, x ray part so uh, this was the again the radiology of our case then the next logical step is uh, asking for an mri because as dr vivek was mentioning in his talk before biopsy we should complete our radiological investigation and like why we should ask for an mri because the examiner will ask you will say after an x ray okay sir i need an mri the next question is why do you need an mri so how does an mri helps in our case or in any bone tumor case is it tells us about the extent of lesion and here is what dr kundu was mentioning mri helps us in the intraosseous extent which is to identify the skip lesions as well as the soft tissue extent 
we can easily tell a soft tissue extent of a tumor in mri so if an examiner asks why do you need to do an mri i think the first point is it tells us the extent of a lesion including interosseous extent and soft tissue extent involvement of a joint which can be very be in much better seen in an mri involvement of a neurovascular bundle and the other most important thing is to plan the biopsy site because we need to do not want to target area which is more lytic or necrotic and we need to go into the solid areas of tumor and sometimes the mri can help us in identifying a specific tumor histologies like a cartilaginous tumor which are very bright i'll be showing the case or fluid fluid levels which is commonly seen in telangiectetic ogs or in aneurysmal bones so this is why we need an mri in a case of a bone tumor if we cover all these points i think the examiner will be very happy that you know why why do you want to do a investigation so going to uh, a case example of all like skip mat this is a proximal humerus osseous sarcoma and you can see a small lesion in the distal metaphyseal area which is a skip metastasis so this was the mri of our case we can see a huge soft tissue arising from the lower end of a femur and it was going right up to the skin margin with an involvement of a skin so that is how the mri helps us in identifying the soft tissue extent of the tumor in planning the biopsy site we know this is a case of a lower end of a femur uh, tumor which is a surface tumor and if we see a if we do a standard biopsy as dr vivek was telling from an intromedial area of a distal femur will miss this lesion completely so mri tells us where exactly the lesion is and sometimes we need to change the biopsy site according to the location of the tumor another case a standard distal femur osseous sarcoma where you can do a standard intromedial biopsy because in this we know that the tumor is all around the femur specific histologies we can see multiple fluid fluid levels here in a case of a suspected malignant tumor in on x ray we know that the diagnosis is a telangiectetic ogs and this is a chondrosarcoma which is very t2 bright and we can make a differential of a chondrosarcoma based only on the basis of mri here so that is how the mri helps you in narrowing your differentials and in planning the biopsy site and planning for surgery so what next i think this talk has already been covered next next step is a simple biopsy i will not be going into the detail of the biopsy but what is more important here for our post graduate students is we should get at least two cores of a 1 cm each or three cores of 0.5 cm each for if you are doing a core needle biopsy so that is very relevant for a pathologist to make a diagnosis otherwise we'll just keep getting a non specific report and we'll be never be able to reach a diagnosis so so our biopsy diagnosis in this case was osteosarcoma fine so uh, and how how do you proceed further now we have a diagnosis of an osteosarcoma then we'll move to the next step staging investigation and this has been covered by dr kapoor just for repetition sake for osteosarcoma for chondrosarcoma and for any other high grade sarcoma of bone the workup is a non contrast ct scan of a chest and a bone scan while for ewing sarcoma the workup is these two with bone marrow biopsy or doing a pet ct this is what the examiner expects you to answer if you have a diagnosis of an osteosarcoma you have to do a non contrast ct scan of a chest with a bone scan and if it is ewing sarcoma then either you add a bone marrow biopsy to above to or ask for a straight away for a pet ct because ewing sarcoma can have a marrow metastasis once you finish your workup then you can do the staging based on these investigations this has also been covered by dr kapoor we know we can only tell the anaking staging or we can go to the we can tell about the ajcc staging you can read through uh, the papers or dr kapoor has already been i'll not be going into this detail but yes after the staging what is most important is our treatment plan because now we know that we are dealing with a non metastatic osteosarcoma of lower end of a femur so what we should go ahead uh, how we should go ahead now whether we should go ahead with the surgery first or a chemotherapy first or chemotherapy followed by surgery or surgery followed by chemotherapy or radiation i think we need to clarify these things a little bit 
by a review of literature so that we know the relative benefit of each and every uh, treatment modality so going to this paper this was i think the initial paper which has shown a role of chemotherapy in osteosarcoma and this is a very relevant paper because whether uh, when the pace tumors were not treated with chemotherapy the survival was only 17% and with chemotherapy this survival improved to 66% this was way back in 1986 and it was a randomized control trial which showed that the chemotherapy improved survival in osteosarcoma i think as a post graduate student we should remember at least one good paper where we say okay the chemotherapy helps in improving the survival and that is why we should use chemotherapy in osteosarcoma another paper published almost at the same time another randomized trial in published in 1987 which also showed the similar results 59 patients in chemotherapy group the survival was significantly better as compared to non chemo chemotherapy group which is 20% so till now we are not talking about a new adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy it was just an adjuvant chemotherapy for osteosarcoma which improved the survival but yes whether we should use a new adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy is a matter of debate how the new adjuvant chemotherapy helps is it used to give us for some time to get the prosthesis if we are planning a limb salvage surgery but now the prosthesis are available off the shelf we have lot of modular prosthesis so i think this advantage is gone it treat micro metastasis early but we are keeping the tumor in the body for almost 2 months so this is also a very doubtful indication of using nsct the other important uh, factor that the new adjuvant helped is to assess for a histological response which is a very important prognostic factor and i think this is the only indication that you, you should use an nsct this is the only important indicator advantage of using a chemotherapy because you can actually predict how the patient is going to behave and it gives us an opportunity to customize the adjuvant chemotherapy if the response to chemotherapy is poor but this also didn't help much in improving the survival so basically there are certain advantages of new adjuvant chemotherapy but the survival advantage of osteosarcoma is based only on the chemotherapy new giving a new adjuvant chemotherapy is not changing the survival of an osteosarcoma even if you use all chemotherapy in an adjuvant setting so i think this is what the post graduate should remember the most do advantages of using a nsct but yes most important thing is to give chemotherapy rather than no chemotherapy uh, because that only changes the outcome in an osteosarcoma i'll not go to this paper the papers in detail but now the next question is now we have finished our chemotherapy now what should be our treatment plan whether we should offer an amputation straight away or we should offer a limb salvage is there any evidence to support that the limb salvage surgeries are safe in tumors so this is a one of the most important paper which in an osteosarcoma which was published by rizoli group and this is the data of 560 patients where 95 patients underwent amputation and 465 patient underwent limb salvage and the disease free survival was actually better in a limb salvage group as compared to an amputation group so this paper clearly says that the limb salvage is absolutely safe and and they can be used and and there is no need to do an amputation so once we have finished our chemotherapy we have to proceed with the local treatment and this paper clearly states that the limb salvage are absolutely safe another paper by the uk group this also suggest the similar findings that limb salvage surgery with effective chemotherapy remains the optimum treatment for osteosarcoma so uh, now is uh, how do we do a limb salvage surgery because we have made our plan we have given the patients appropriate chemotherapy and we move uh, and we have uh, we know the diagnosis we have given chemotherapy and now is how do we plan our surgery i think this is also very relevant for a post graduate to understand as dr kapoor was mentioning we have three components i'll say we have two components first is a resection and second is reconstruction which includes both bone and soft tissue and the aim is to give an optimal function to the patient and patient we understand at this point is we had a biopsy diagnosis we have received the appropriate new adjuvant therapy 
and have an appropriate chemotherapy gap i think this the third point is where we always miss an appropriate chemotherapy gap is very important in a malignant bone tumor because if we have a gap of more than 3 weeks we are actually increasing our chance of failure so many of the time the patient comes late or we get a, we waste a lot of time in imaging investigation and the chemotherapy gap increases so in that scenario it is better to give one more cycle of chemotherapy and have an appropriate chemotherapy gap because that only dictates the will dictate the prognosis of a patient so we have to achieve wide margins in limb salvage surgery and we should have a function which is at least equivalent to or superior to an amputation so these are the two basic principles of a limb salvage surgery able to achieve wide margins and function which is at least equivalent or superior to an amputation dr kapoor has covered an aching concept of margins we know that the interlesal margin is when we go into the tumor a marginal margin is when we go close to the tumor in the pseudo capsule a wide margin is when we grow through the normal tissue and a radical margin is an extra compartmental excision so going to the case we this is the osteosarcoma lower end femur and it is very easy to understand the longitudinal margins because we know we can easily gap make measure from the tumor the superior and the inferior extent uh, and we can easily take this longitudinal margins but what about the circumferential margins if we see the axial imaging we can see that the neurovascular bundle is very close to the tumor and the skin is also very close to the tumor and all is less than 2 cm so are we not getting a wide margins here so here comes the concept of natural barriers and qualitative margin as you can see in the picture the c is being actually uh, uh, withheld by a big rock so that is how the tumor also are are restricted by the natural barriers which helps us in taking the margins and this is a paper by kawaguchi et al which actually has qualified barriers at the tissue that has any resistance against tumor invasion which include fascia joint capsule tendons periosteum vascular sheath cartilage pleura peritoneum and epineurium and they qualified the barriers into thick barriers and thin barriers a thick barrier is a physically strong tissue with a white luster through which underlying tissue cannot be seen like a iliotibial band joint capsule or peritoneum of an infant or young child while a thin barrier is a weaker tissue through which the underlying tissue can be seen which is a healthy fascia of a muscle or peritoneum in adults or vascular sheath and epineurium so a thick barrier gives us a 3 cm margin and a thin barrier gives a 2 cm margin so going back to the case if we know that now we know that between the skin and the tumor we have a deep fascia and between the tumor and the vessels we have a vascular sheath and between the tumor and the nerve we have an epineurium so we all have 2 cm margins because this is the tissue which gives us margins so this is a very important concept to understand that how to get wide margins even if the tumor is close to important structures the challenges to surgeon in a successful limb salvage are many and i think these are the most important challenges that we face which is a poorly placed biopsy incision major vascular involvement encasement of a major nerve pre operative infection and inadequate mortars after resection and this is where we face a challenge in doing a successful limb salvage going to a poorly placed biopsy scar or a local infection like this case of a clear cell sarcoma the scar is on the medial side we can see some discharge from the swelling it was involving the bone so in this case we cannot put a conventional mega prosthesis because there is a local infection and because the tumor is in the bone and there is an involvement the skin is involved medially so we need to plan for a flap and we can do a modified limb salvage where we put a cement spacer with antibiotics to reduce the risk of infection and we cover the defect with a flap so this is a modified limb salvage we are doing a knee arthrodesis putting a cement spacer using a flap so as to uh, help us still doing a limb salvage rather than doing an amputation other important challenge that we face is a major vascular involvement like in this case of a soft tissue sarcoma groin we can dissect the tumors with the femoral vessels and we can reconstruct with the femoral vessel autograft or the or the artificial graft like in this case done with the ptfe graft so a major vascular involvement is also not a contraindication for limb salvage but yes we need to reconstruct the major vessels with a vascular graft 
other is an encasement of a major motor nerve if i see a tumor in the leg and the sciatic nerve is encased or a posterior tibial nerve is encased yes patient should go amputation but in upper limb even if one nerve is involved like in this case of a high grade sarcoma involving the ulnar nerve we can dissect the tumor with one nerve and the bone and reconstruct with the flap and uh, you can see that patient can get a good function even if one nerve is sacrificed so per se involvement of a major motor nerve is a contraindication to limb salvage in lower limb but not in upper limb inadequate motors after resection this is also a very important concept to understand that this is the case of a lower end femur osteosarcoma involving uh, because there was a pathological fracture it involved the rectus femoris so we have to resect the tumor and you can see it's a complete extra articular resection where we do not have any motor left after the resection so in this case the only option is doing an arthro disease and and we got some issues with the skin flap but it healed uh, after uh, after a plastic Where surgery procedure so you can ha? see uh, kar lo. a good function a after with an arthro disease so what is important here is we should understand that the function of an arthro disease should be superior to an amputation here and in knee we can expect a good function of an after, after an arthro disease so up uh, involvement of the major motors is also not a contraindication if you know your reconstruction very well as we could do here doing a uh, uh, doing a knee arthro disease so to conclude here is a good limb salvage surgery is just a part in comprehensive management of primary bone tumors so if i have to say limb salvage adequate chemotherapy and adequate chemotherapy gap all are very relevant and evaluating and managing a tumor case is a comprehensive process and we should learn to become oncologists as well as surgeons it is should not be a heroic orthopedic surgeon with an saw in his hand to do an amputation but it should be a team the orthopedic surgeon is a surgeon is a part of a team of an oncologist to help get a patient optimal functional as well as the oncological outcome thank you very much